Mariba is set two hours north of Cairns. Once famous for its tobacco industry, it attracted a large migrant population to work for farms. With the advent of technology, many of these people have found themselves without a job. Now Mariba boasts a few avocado farms and the only pub closest to the Gulf. Mariba once had a proud farming past, but this has all changed. The people are now searching for a new identity and it's causing friction within the town. We do have certain crime rates that are higher than other areas in the country. For example, our assault rates are fairly high. Uh, we have a number of alcohol issues but then our break and enter rates and uh, uh, property offences are a lot lower than other places in Australia. Darrell with his wife Linda runs the Cornland Stud. He's a third generation farmer who's seen Mariba change drastically in the past few years. The money has not been managed correctly. Yeah, it's not only with Aboriginal people, it's with white people, it's with the whole lot. Yeah. And when there's no management, Chaos. It's chaos. We end up with trouble. Yep. And we see it time after time after time. I'll tell you another little exercise I did. I used to have a portable sawmill out at Richmond. And uh, there was another chap at a place called Silver Hills there. And he used to do the same. Alvin Torrenbeck was his name, Jeff. I don't I know, know if you... I know him, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, he had the same thing that Jeff was doing. He had all the young ones there and educating them. And he came to me one day and he said, Daryl, I've got... The three young fellas here, he said, you're interested in taking them on? I said, yeah, I'll take them on. Well, so, they were 180 kilometres I was 180 kilometres out in the middle of the scrub and I had this portable saw mill and we had two inloaders for handling the timber, a log and truck, a tractor with a saw bench on it, and a tar polding, and a camp oven and a billy can. And that was us. I went up there and these young fellas came up there and by the time they had left, they could all operate an inloader, they could all use a saw bank, they could all cook a feed. And they could all lift a the, um, railway sleeper, because yeah, that's what we and were cutting. They were all fitted up and they were good lads. Anyhow, they all went out and got jobs. One young fella, who was Tootsie Holzheimer's grandson, oh, yeah, yeah. Jason, Jason White. He was, he was a twin. Jason ended up out there. He, he went into a bit of trouble. He went we back out there. to Cairns. And uh, he tried to get a job, and he couldn't get the job that suited him. So anyhow, he went with an old professional fisherman. Up in the Gulf. Up in the Gulf, and he worked with him for a, quite a long time. Mm, a few years. Anyhow, we walked into the shopping centre in Cairns. It was wet season time. Wet season time. And I looked up and I said to Linda, that's young Jason pushing them trolleys. Coming down here, shouldn't be in here pushing bloody shopping trolleys. Anyhow, he seen me and he walked up to me and I said, what are you doing in here, boy, pushing these shopping trolleys? He said, oh, Daryl, he said, no, he said, I'm down here doing night study. He said, I'm getting me masters. He said, and I just thought I'd do this in my spare time. He said, and get a few bob together. You know what he did, Jeff? He had tears in his eyes and he said to me, he said, do you know what, Mr. Paradise? He said, I'm pleased you taught me to work. Mariba has a large transient population of hunters. Many of them are attracted to the area by the huge numbers of feral pigs. Like hunks of meat, they've got 1080 in to kill dingoes and pigs. They can double dose it for pigs. And we just go around and kill them and use our money, our fuel, our bullets, and they let us do it. So, hatch them barrel Monday. And... What's the story with the dogs? Oh, we catch them. We don't take rifles, it's just with the knives. Just... <laughs> Grab their back legs yeah, and stab them. Yeah. Brown and white one, he's 10 year old. 10 year old, he's gone through eight partners. He's, they come, they die, or they shoot them, or the pig kills them, rips them up. The dog. He's taught eight guys to be his mate. And you run these at night, especially on pups. This is only a Tesco. Full breastplate for four grown dogs. Like that, that one there, that leather one, or That's that one over on the back of the four wheeler. Yeah. Where do you get 
Yeah, where do you get those from? A local guy makes them. But we add all the lights and that, so it just helps us at night to hunt. <laughs> Actually, the kids have two weeks, probably two or three times a year, and they go out on the outstation with these mob with the elders, and they teach them the proper, because the kids eat turtle and fire. that, because it's fading out. At the age of 75, Jeff Guest runs the Petford training camp. For 20 years, he's been helping the people of Mareeba overcome their drug and alcohol problems and find employment. Asking me what to do, that's a bit of a tricky question. We break in horses, but our main thing is we help people. We help a range of people from very elderly to very young. Families, we give them support, give them through some tough times. And that, and I think it's important to be able to do that. What's this place? Petford. We're really struggling to keep it. It was 85 square mile, now it's down to 25 acres, which isn't much at all. Um, we had quarters, we could accommodate 24 young people. We had quarters for older people and family a few kilometres away. We had a tourist camp. We had ways of making money, mine tin, broken horses. Did leather work, we sold swags and saddles, and which was good for the young fellows to learn a range of skills. It's a bit of a funny community. I think it's um, it's a bit of a torn community. Um, Not really. There's um, there's a lot of um, inequality. There's a lot of poor people. Um, have a lot of people here come down from the missions um, because they've become um, dry missions now where they can't drink um, and, and that causes a problem for everyone, indigenous and, and whites alike. Um, and it's a shame but yeah I, I think wherever you go where you have such a diversity of um, culture you're always going to have racism and inequality um, and it's more evident here because it's a smaller place. You know, but it's sad. You do have people sleeping on the streets and, and stuff like that happening. And it is really sad because I don't think anybody um, should live like that, not, not in the 21st century anyway. So has this kind of inspired you to do study? Yeah, study and um, I'm, I was a main instigator with the skate park because, you know, I, I really believe kids, if they get bored, um, will get into trouble. You know, this what it, a lot of it is boredom. Um, and not having opportunities to keep themselves occupied. So the skate park is um, it's actually facilitated to be able to sit skateboarders, um, kids on um, roller skates and bikes. And all our surrounding shires have one except Mareeba. So, um, but the council's approved it, we've just got to help raise some funds. Pipsy! Just down the street, Josie lives with her three dogs and her son, Rick. Come here, Basil, come here. Basil! With the closure of Mareeba's Bas tobacco industry, she is now retired. I just hope nobody comes into Mareeba. It has to be a dead town, a ghost town. But there's no playground for kids. There's no outing for kids. There's nothing in here. There's no need for the young people to go and do, you know, like... You can't go and play. play. Or they have, like, you know, like in Sydney or like that, they've got, like, a roller skating ring, an ice skating ring. They've got nothing here for the kids. Yes, they have. Where's the ice All we've got is a broken piece of steel, half moon in oh, front of that no, park no, no, this is a big fifty thousand dollars for about eight kids. No, this is a That's all Mariba's of... got, eight kids. But where's that? Where about in the park? Front of the you know those things that go down <laughs> half moon play, half a tank. Eight kids are in that club there. And they got that going. You can throw an egg on it, a young kid can fall down, crack his head. Or, for, or burn himself badly on the on the tin. Yeah, Fifty thousand dollar wasted our money, rates money, put out there. There was a swing and it's gone. There's nothing there for the kids to play on. What would you put kids. in there with that eight thousand dollars? Or fifty thousand? Fifty thousand, I reckon that cost to put up. What would you put here instead? I would. Well, put something where kids can have a bit of games. You now, when you go on a picnic sort of thing like that. And don't kids... bother putting PYCY. Because my kids have seen all the boys and girls around and the boy and the girl in the middle fucking each other, putting a blank straight, sorry if you go boo, but that's what they were doing in the hall. Mariba has one of the highest youth delinquency rates in the country. To counteract this, 
police have instituted and enforced tougher new laws. They just can't see you. As you're driving that way, they pulled out and followed you around and around about and everything. I couldn't find them. I don't see them. So they know your name, Ricky? Yeah, they know me pretty well. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. They call me cunt and everything, fuckhead, so I just started abusing them just like they abused me. So. Let's see the fire. Don't come home and complain to me, or you'll get another hiding. You get hit at school, you go and hit them. That's to no. That's the punch. punch, that's to kick, and teeth to bite. Give this, hit him with that. Because mm -hmm. if I go to not Jeff, I'll go to hit him, well, he's going to watch for this. <laughs> so he'll be watching, he'll go like that. But at the same time, I'll be going like that. Yeah, I'm the elbow will hit him, not the elbow. <laughs> that's that's right. Right. That's all right. I like the <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to hit him with the punch, it. I'll hit him with the elbow. Which he will not suspect me to hit him with the elbow. That's where the school teachers were nuts. Because if I wanted to bring them up outlaws, I could have brought them up my way. <laughs> the wild way, mafia way, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to be one. Oh yeah, that's your background. <laughs> I'm not. So you're Italian? Yeah, you're a crossbreed. <laughs> no, but he was, we went to school and this young kid, he turned around picking on me all the time. And he said to him, yeah, you. He said, oh, you're a uh, motherfucker. You hit him? No. You should hit him. Now, what he said is, do you want your face rearranged? Oh, okay. that, that's and that you're incident. Warning. Yeah. Six <laughs> weeks suspension he got. And then, he, and I'm going to kick nothing. Not one That's a good thing. Day. Getting paid 100 bucks a day, cash in the hand, go back to school. Go to tuck shop first in line, give them a hundred dollar note because I was going to bought a pie, had nothing more. They're like, where'd you get that money from? Did you steal it? Straight up the office again. Back down the street, Veneera's sons are discussing the different nationalities that make up Mariba. White and black. They're either white or black, Chris. They can't no, be purple. Not. Isn't that unreal? The kids, you could actually think that. Asians are completely different to Anglo-Saxons or to Indigenous people. There are other yeah, cultures, Maddie. Yeah, but they're still Maddie. white or black. No! Other countries, not, Africa. It's not about your colour, it's about your culture. Yeah, like, if I was Chinese, people probably would treat me different if I was in Australia. But like, say if I was in well, Australia, and I saw a Chinese person, I would make fun of them saying, ha ha, you're Chinese, you come from a different country. It's not even that well, ha ha, that? we just do not, we don't wouldn't? make any, um, any sort of allowances for other cultures. We say, oh, we're multicultural. What's that? Multicultural is only to do it the Anglo-Saxon way, John Howard's way. Multicultural is, is to respect that people have a right to have their own spiritual practices, their beliefs, um, abide by Australian law. On the other side of town, Venice is upset about his new neighbours who have arrived from a dry community where alcohol was banned. Seven days a week, there was alcohol and drugs in that house. And that's why, and then they turned around and blamed my son for something that he didn't do when all of this was going on. I even seen an 11 year old girl, her mother gave her marijuana and then she asked her, what do you got in the can? And she said, oh, rum and cola, 11 years old. And what they do, one lot sits at the back fence, They're all the ones from say up to 18 with their little bong and the big ones are in the in the house with their bong. And the minute that they finish that that those two bongs, somebody will always go in a taxi and go and get it, or somebody will turn up with it. Yeah. And I know I know about three. What one? Well, they closed down two, so there's one, two, three, four. Yeah, there's four places. I, I don't even smoke it. 
And I know where you to get it. it? I, oh yeah, I do. Yeah, I went from 13 and a half stone to to 10, 10 stone five in in six weeks. I was on a heavy. Not me and my missus had had an argument, and I was. That's all I was living on was a pie and marijuana, pie and a can of soft drink a day. That's all. It's, and the, I was stoned the whole time. Yeah. Do you understand why they do it then? Why do they do it? Well, I think to try and relax. They, they, they think that it can relax the body. It does relax the body, but you don't mix it with alcohol because those two things do not mix. They don't. Because the aggro, they'll sit down. I've watched them over here. They'll be sitting down there, and one out of that crew will argue about something. And then you'll have the whole... It'll, it's like an explosion. Everybody will get involved in it and a big fight. Then they all sit down after and forget about it. That, and then next day, it's all forgotten. Those Aboriginals in that country there, they were born horsemen, born cattlemen, sense of direction. And as far as nature went, they were second to none. They just knew their job. But, and then it happened to young ones, and this is what I was saying before, because they don't spend enough time in the bush with the older cultured people, they don't grow up in the right way. And this is what I said before. It should be more like the likes of Jeff when he had those young people, educating them, teaching them the bush, teaching them their culture, and they've taken it all away now. So what have we got now? Where are all them young people going to go? We've got nowhere for them to go. So, and they're going to learn nothing. So what's going to happen shortly, all our jails are going to overflow because these young people of today have got into all the trouble as whereas they could have been out learning to work, learning their culture. But it's the same with the white and, people. Yeah. But, you know, and it's not necessarily just Aboriginal people, it's the white people as well. Like there's plenty of white people that don't understand that could go and learn a lot about culture and things too. It's not only the Aboriginal people. Yeah. But, you know, and of course, it reverts back to funding. You've got to have money and the governments have got to understand and go and have a look for themselves. Okay, no end stops. Australia's gone through a few different stages to what it was at before the war. Um, at, Australia was very much a working group, no mustering shearers, shearers, miners, most of them were small-scale workers in the bush. Um, and they're pretty proud of helping one another and sticking by. You know, they had arguments and fights, but they're proud of how many posts they could cut a day, how many sheep they could shear, what balls they could throw, um, how many fence posts they could cut. Uh, but now when you talk about working hard, people look at you stupid. You may say you're going to bust your boiler for that. You know, we used to race one another to cutting posts or doing things we like to say, right, I can cut 12 can a, can a day, I can cut 120 posts a day with an axe, I can shovel so, so many tonne underground. Um, but now they, we've changed because they've got machinery and there's lots of change and we have to accept those changes. People are always changing. So what makes up an Australian then? No, I, I, I don't think it but because we're such, we've got such a face of different people, we've got a wealth of different people coming from other countries with a bit different culture and ways. Um, I, I don't think you'd say, well, that's an Australian way, because they're cities. You know, the, the, the city people are completely different from how I think and how I live. So you can't sum up Australian? Well, you can't because we're, we're so, there's so many people, there's so many different groups, you know, it, a fisherman's different from it's somebody driving a taxi in a city. Got a different outlook. Like a, on a small fishing boat, you know, where there's only four or five men. You know, he's very much dependent on one another. Um, so we're, we're very much a multifaceted group of people. And the saying we're putting some one mold won't work anymore. Now it might have worked first for a war, but mm. we're, we've changed greatly. In my time, it changed greatly.